Lucy Westenra is 19, and despite being cast as a joyous ingenue, a worthy price for any worthy man, she comes over to the modern mind as almost totally devoid of admirable qualities. She is a pampered upper middle class child with a silver spoon still showing the perfect damsel in distress. One critic describes her as silly, transparent, gushy, giggly, beautiful and good. Another as a fragile, porcelain, simple-minded creature. All Lucy seems concerned about is her own pleasure. She is a kept woman whose idle life involves no more than trivial recreations. Picture galleries, walking and riding in the parks, rowing, tennis and fish fishing. She is overburdened even by writing regularly to her best friend. The only aspect of her life to arouse curiosity is infuriatingly left unexplained. Stokers tantalizingly let slip that she, like her late father before her, was in childhood and a habitual sleepwalker. Dracula sensibly takes advantage of this habit to make her acquaintance during their mutual nocturnal jaunts. So inclined, she makes an ideal eve for the visiting serpent. For as her friend says of her, she is of too super sensitive a nature to go through the world without trouble. If her sleepwalking is the key to her relationship with Dracula, it is her good looks that spark the emotional entanglements which bind the central characters together. No less than three men, Dr. Seward, Arthur Homewood, and Quincy Morris, friends of, my, of, of many years, fall hopelessly in love with her. This in itself says much about courtship patterns a century ago, where marriage was frequently a matter of economics. Social, social class and arrangement. Many a modern man will see Lucy, despite her beauty and financial resources, as less than a desirable companion for the rest of his days, and will feel little sympathy for Seward and Morris, whose proposals are turned down. Homewood is the either unlucky or lucky one. He himself is so unremarkable that the cynic might say they make a good match. Throughout, Lucy shows such a dearth of character that the notorious Malleus Maleficarum might have had her in his sights when it castigated women. She is, as it is declared of her sex, totally gullible. She is duped by Kinsey Morris, of all people, into believing on account of all his tall stories, that he is really well educated. She confines, we women are such cowards that we think a man will save us from fears and we marry him. She is forever reminding Mina of how happy she is with her own love life, selfishly oblivious to the stress her friend is experiencing without news from Jonathan in Transylvania. Nor has Lucy the slightest intention of remaining faithful to her beloved. She might love Arthur, but she hardly hinders the amorous count. She can have her cake and eat it. Here, not for the first time, the author's intentions and the modern reader's perceptions diverge. Stoker intends his stricken char characters to be the embodiment of Victorian virtue, not realizing that their plastic, antiseptic goodness repels more than it attracts. Lucy somehow has men fawning all over her, and she revels in it. She almost admits to being a horrid flirt, and acknowledges feelings of exultation at collecting proposals. Perhaps it is a form of power she is exercising, an insatiable appetite for counting suitors. Certainly, there were Victorian women who collected marriage proposals and flaunted them as a sign of their worth and desirability, as Lucy herself admits. Some male readers may identify her, euphemistically, as a phallic teaser. To be fair, Lucy does have a rebellious streak. 
After all, she chooses her husband for herself without discussing the matter beforehand with her mother. She also sighs with frustration that she cannot marry all three suitors. This might be seen as a glimmer of hope that somewhere deep in her unconscious lies a, a latent dissatisfaction with her dull conformity and a yearning to rebel and allow her as yet poorly developed sensuality free reign. A girl with no destiny, she finds only one, one only through Dracula's kiss. She would have passed through life leaving no shadow until a chance encounter turns that metaphor into reality. Attention is often turned to that most unusual of surnames, Westenla. Possibly it is an amalgam of the West being under attack from the East and Ra, the pagan sun god. Lucy, in other words, is meant to be the light of the West. Other critics have fastened on her Christian name, which can perhaps be treated, treated as a derivative of Lucifer. She does indeed become a servant of the devil. It is curious how Stoker resists all temptation at detailed physical description where his heroines are concerned, confining, confining his descriptive effort, efforts to the two central antagonists, Dracula and Van Helsing. All we are told is that Lucy is pale and thin long before Dracula gets near her and Kinsey Morris speaks of her little shoes, so she may have been of slight build. She has rippling black hair to offset her fragile countenance. Her friend Mina is made of sterner stuff. Christened Wilhelmina Mary, she marries Jonathan Harker, whom she has known since childhood during the course of the novel. Mina is referred to as a sweet-faced, dainty-looking girl. She is merely attractive, where, whereas it is Lucy who is blessed with the stunning, eye-catching looks. Mina wears her hair long and loose, so that she can pull it round to hide her face if upset. On one occasion, she loans Lucy her shoes, so the two girls were presumably of similar size, both slender creatures. Mina is no weakling, however chasing around Whitby in the middle of the night up and down its cliffs in a way that would tax a trained athlete. She is deeply religious, offering a prayer of thankfulness after surviving the slightest adventure. The two girls have been intimate friends since childhood, though when considering their differences, this is somewhat surprising. Mina is, unlike Lucy, a working girl, probably an orphan. She knew neither her father nor her mother. A productive member of society and of lower social caste than her friend. The respective pairings underline their class position. Lucy becomes betrothed to the arist aristocracy, twice to a future lord, then a count. While Mina takes on a humble solicitor's clerk. When the reader meets her, Mina is an assistant schoolmistress teaching etiquette and decorum in Exeter. She must be a year or so older than Lucy, and may even have taught her, for she was once Lucy's friend and guide when she came from the schoolroom to prepare for the world of life. The girls' personalities are also markedly different. Mina is as resourceful as Lucy is resourceless. What Mina sees in Lucy to warrant her patient affection is almost as mysterious as the male trio's infatuation with her vacuous friend. Mina shows considerable forbearance, probably acting out a sense of duty towards her ill-fated companion. Though, given her caring, maternal nature towards everybody, it would be in keeping for her to overlook Lucy's faults and see only her good qualities. Mina is the nearest thing to a saint that Stoker can conceive of. She has shown no hint of malice throughout her life. She cuddles and comforts all the men in their distress over Lucy, always puts the welfare of others before herself, 
and even in her own direst agonies can say this of her tormentor, Dracula. Jonathan, dear, and you all my true, true friends, 